During the course of pregnancy, different cardiac abnormalities of the baby may be detected through a simple fetus ultrasound. This is a case of those where the mother attends a routine prenatal checkup and her baby was diagnosed with fetal critical aortic stenosis. Recently delayedly detected during week 28 and 4 days of pregnancy, left ventricular hyperplasia is morphologically revealed. In the projection of the four chambers we have hypocontractibility of the left ventricle, however with a right ventricle functioning almost normal. In the color flow mapping, we observe a left ventricle that barely can be filled, due to such mitral regurgitation, thus obtaining a remaining airflow of approximately 3 mm per second. An important data that was evaluated was a ventricular inversion showing a restrictive filling pattern. These were the indicative criteria for the intervention. Since the left ventricular ejection valve is abnormal here, notice the aortic valve has such a limited movement itself, as well as a very compromised left ventricular function. We have measured the aortic ring diameter that equals 3.4 millimeters, and again, we see a valve that hardly opens. The flow mapping shows the existence of a small and weakened ejection that still remains anti-grade through the aortic valve. In this moment, we see a transverse fetal position, in which the ductus arteriosus and great vessels are directing the ventricular flow towards the descending aorta, acting as a true transitory bypass from the left heart. Likewise, the entire transverse arch shows retrograde or inverse flow, as some authors may call it, revealing this typical feature of critical valve stenosis. It is important to underline this finding, the reverse flow. We clearly see that the flow is being redirected to the left atrium, due to the aortic valve narrowing, indeed, an abnormal Doppler flow feature. Having said that, we shall try to repair this narrowed valve, and thus, get such left ventricle back to work and grow as normal as possible. This is a relatively simple procedure. The material used, in this case, is a 18-gauge needle, which allows the passage of a 3 mm and a half panther biotronic balloon catheter, with a length of 10 mm. We have chosen this measure to be able to dilate 10 to 20% more the damaged ring valve, which in this particular patient, was found to measure 3.4 mm in diameter. This is our height pressure inflation device designed to exert pressure for our balloon, both, inflation and deflation. As we see here, we are utilizing a 3.5 mm balloon with a guide at one end. It will guide us and assist us to maintain the correct position of the balloon, as well as hold it firmly and attach it in its final position. This is the body of the catheter, we stick adhesive tape as reference laws, to be aware when the catheter, and balloon have completely passed through. The mother underwent conscious sedation by both Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Anesthesiology, using dilutions of fentanyl, as a synthetic analgesic opioid, an anticholinergic agent muscarinic antagonist, atropine, and pancuronium bromide, as a muscle neuroblocking agent, commercially called pavulon, which will provide the patient with adequate skeletal muscle relaxation during the course of this procedure. We also have syringes prepared with adrenaline and atropine.
We proceed making the initial incision using our first scalpel. We are in an adequate position now. The technique is to maintain a straight line between the puncture site and the baby's left ventricle, always being guided by the monitor echo images. We already have passed the abdominal wall of the mother. Now we continue to overpass the uterine wall. The aim is to insert first the needle catheter exactly into the left ventricular apex. Now here, we break through the fetal thorax, in order to immediately find ourselves facing the left ventricular apex. As expected, we have a slight bleeding. We continue to introduce the catheter, the guide opens up the way to the aortic valve, as you can see here. The catheter has already came across the aortic valve, now we back up a little, so that the balloon is mounted correctly. We place the balloon, in its final position, although it takes several tries, before releasing it. With the inflation device, we inflate the balloon, until reaching 27 atmospheres of pressure, always adjusting the nomenclature as many times as necessary. Now we gradually remove the guide from the ascending aorta path. We leave the ventricular chamber, and the guide is pulled out from the left ventricular wall.
At this time, as we anticipated, there is a slight pericardial effusion, which we shall drain and control adequately. Back to the echo, after the catheter needle and the guide were both withdrawn carefully, we are ready to handle the spill, which is very common in this type of procedure, but with expert hands is removed in its totality. As we see here, the liquid has been removed, and we do not observe any additional pericardial collection. However, let's be wise and prudent, and wait for 10 to 15 minutes or more, with the aim of ensuring that there is no more bleeding, and the puncture represents no longer a threat. Later on, in the operating room, we return to the fetal echocardiogram analysis to observe the flow pattern, and as you can visualize, the procedure can be presumed to have been effective already. With a normally functioning valve, now, the left ventricle will alleviate much of the stress it was on. So from now on, we hope that the chambers will develop their normal sizes. Now we can see the projection of the four chambers, notice that the pericardium borders have no longer liquid collections. Immediately we can see a slight relief in the left ventricular wall, due to the decreasing internal pressure. We see an important fibrous layer here, but there is also sufficient heart muscle, which is thicker compared to the right ventricle. Analyzing the Doppler flow mapping, we have an improvement in left ventricular load. Obviously, we still cannot say the same thing about the condition of the right ventricle, which, in due time, will take more to recover. Noticeably, the left ventricular diastolic pressure has dropped. Here we see a moderate-sized aorta, of which we'll also keep watching its evolution through the following months. Now let's take a look at a projection of the aortic valve, and we see a much better movement of the valve, and clearly, an enterograde flow, filling the entire ascending aorta, which is a parameter of success. The flow in the transverse arch is already anterograde, if we recall correctly, it was totally retrograde previous to the procedure. Despite the corrected ventricular function, there is still a slight weakness, which we hope, over time can be recovered. Now in the transverse plane of the baby, here we identify its ductus artariosus, 
and a portion of the aortic arch in its transverse position, notice that its flow is now already at E grade. Here we can remark that mitral insufficiency has decreased significantly, as you also can point out, here the ventricular filling has been compromised. There are three goals of fetal aortic valvuloplasty. One is to modify the physiology of the left heart in a fetus with severe aortic stenosis, before irreversible damage occurs to the left ventricle. Hence, prevent progression of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Thirdly, achieve biventricular circulation and the subsequent improvement of postnatal morbidity and mortality. Obviously, a systematic qualitative follow-up of this case will be carried out during the rest of the gestation period. We estimate the final gradient in this case is about 100 at this point. On the other hand, the baby is stable without any complications.